Okay, let me go continue. Okay. So um, about the troublesome story. So I, I've been covering wildfires in Colorado for going on, well, since 2000, 1998. How did you so, get into that? Um, basically when I worked, I used to work for, I'm a Colorado native, so I used to work for um, the Rocky Mountain News and do work for them. And um, I basically was sent to a fire one time um, the Buffalo Creek fire, which was clear back, I believe in 98 or 99 or 2000, somewhere in there. I can't remember the exact year, but um, I was sent to that fire and I was just so intrigued because I think this was the start. Colorado had not seen a lot of wildfires before then. It was, you know, we, we saw a blow up of the Buffalo Creek fire, I think was one of the biggest fires that had come out of, you know, the front range. We saw it from a long way away. It was like a 4% humidity. And I was sent up to it as a news photojournalist to cover it. And um, I really was intrigued by it. I mean, just how, how it developed, learned a lot about fire behavior, things like that. Um, then sub subsequently, we had more fires the next year and the next year, and they just kept getting progressively worse. Um, I went in and I had done a lot of work for West Metro Fire at the time and I had talked to one of the fire chiefs and I went through some fire training um, and then I did some um, structural fire training and then I went on to uh, getting certified in wildland which is um, a couple of classes well not a couple but it was a, quite a, an intensive program um, to past the S-130, S-220 basic wildland and advanced wildland firefighting and learn about the ins and outs of forest fires, fire behavior, um, things like how it starts, how it progresses, where to be safe, where not to be safe, um, what to do if you have to deploy your fire shelter, uh, cutting lines, basically everything that has to do with fires. Um, so I went through all that and I passed the agility test and the pack test and all of this and um, kind of got hooked up with a couple of fire departments that, um, you know, I went in with them on fires and learned more about it. And um, like I said, the fires just keep getting worse every year. They're getting bigger. Now they're no longer just fires. They're more like mega fires that are happening, especially last year. But so um, how did you wind up then in Grand County at this fire? Um, I was on my way to the Cameron Peak fire to cover that, and the Calwood fire blew up right in front of me when I was driving through Boulder. It literally just came out of nowhere, and I was on that fire for a day or about a day and a half that night and the following day, and then basically just right after that, um, I started hearing radio traffic about how fast this fire was spreading, and I went up to Grand County and I watched that fire go from, you know, a, a small fire again to something that is just mega fire. Uh, I keep saying that, but that's exactly what it was. It was um, from what I heard on radio traffic, uh, humidity levels, winds were coming out of the, the west to the east at a high rate of speed. I followed the weather for that. I'm a weather chaser, storm chaser. So I follow, I follow a lot of this, this scientific part of it to know kind of where, what fires are doing and what could become of them. So I was up in Grand County that night when it came through and um, I just saw some previous weather from the Cal Wood fire of just fire tornadoes, erratic wind behaviors, um, just incredible fires that were basically making their own weather. Um, from looking on storm charts and things like that, I could see, you know, things were actually blowing up and it wasn't a weather thing. It was, it was a, it was the fire. It was making its own weather and it really intrigued me. So that's why I went up to this fire and needless to say, I was in the right place at the right time because this thing blew up like I've never seen a fire before. Um, I've seen, I've covered extensive fires from beginning to end, from when they started to when they, to weeks and months later, um, rebuilding, 
regrowth, stuff like that. And looking at fires and the forests that they burn, I've never seen anything like it in the Sun Valley area. It was like um, the fire had gotten so big when it came over the ridge down into Grand Lake and Sun Valley that it developed its own weather, weather pattern. And when it hit the coolness of the valley, it almost sucked everything up into it and then just let loose underneath it. And it flattened trees in all different directions, which to me is something like almost like a microburst. Um, the fire had built such a weather pattern, it just, the bottom fell out of it and just flattened trees left and right. Um, usually when fires burn, the trees are still standing, but they're burnt, some fall over, but this was just like somebody had dropped a nuclear bomb on that, on the backside of Rocky Mountain National Park. Mm -hmm. And then hearing radio traffic that it had breached the Continental Divide, which is extraordinarily rare because you've got to figure for a fire to burn above timberline and have the winds be so erratic and so powerful that it would actually push, um, you know, debris and, uh, you know, pine cones, trees, uh, parts of trees burning over the Continental Divide and not put it out because any firefighter would look at that and think that that's a very natural fire break. It's, it's above tree line, there's nothing to burn. The oxygen is thinner up there, so it would burn itself out, and it didn't. So um, that's what kept me following this fire for days on days up there. So obviously, you have some special training that you mentioned, but how do you get access to take the photos that you did? Um, basically, that fire I was in there before it ever got to Grand Lake. I was there right when it was, you know, before it happened. Before they shut everything down, I got in there and. I had my escape route if I needed to get out. If the fire had came down to a point, I had access to Grand Lake to, you know, as a safety escape route. Um, but I was in there before they shut anything down. So um, when it when it basically started getting, when I heard that it was moving at a rate, rate that it was, I was up there and ready to shoot and put myself in a position. So. Um, do you have a really good zoom lens or are you really as close to the fire as it looks in a lot of the photos? I was really as close as it looks. In some of those pictures, it was a point of shooting over my shoulder because the, the, the radiant heat coming off the fire was so intense you couldn't stand to look at it. It would, even through my fire, my goggles and my shroud and my helmet, you could still feel the radiant fire around exposed skin. Um, you could feel it. Uh, um, just, I mean, from even, you know, 200 feet away um, to 300 feet away, you could still, that radiant heat coming off of it is enough to make your eyes just water profusely. It's, it burns. It, at a couple of points, I couldn't even see because my eyes were just, so it, it seems weird that with fire would dry your eyes out, but it, it burns so bad. I was shooting over my shoulder on some of these and, um, it was, it, it's, it's an extremely dangerous place, but in some of the places I was literally down close to the water. So I, I basically had my safe way out. You know, if I had to I'd jump in the water or I would have um, escape route out 34, which at that time I knew, you know, there was fire burning up to the road. So I knew if I, if I had to escape out that way, I could, or I could go to, into Grand Lake and feel safe because you know the fire wasn't going to burn down to the lake but it obviously wasn't going to jump Grand Lake. Were you ever scared for your safety during this? Um, not really because I think a lot of times your adrenaline kicks in and I'm in such a work mode I kind of put you know in the back of my mind I know when enough is enough and I have to I, I have to set down the cameras and, and exit stage left. I'm not gonna put myself in a position where that's the last picture I'll take, but it, it is a very scary thing, but it's kind of tucked away in the back of your mind because you have a job to do and you're there to document and get these pictures and, and you, know, you wanna be around to be able to show the pictures afterwards. So 
you, you, you kind of, it's kind of a catch 22. You're, you're thinking about it, but it's not on, you know, it's not like right there in front because you, you're busy doing a job and you, you that, that kind of takes over sometimes, so. I read that um, you took over 9,000 images of the fire and its aftermath. Um, you know, at that point in time, obviously you didn't know it was gonna become this exhibit that it is now in Grand Lake. So what were you hoping to accomplish by taking all of these photos? Um, I, like I said, I have really had an interest in natural disasters and fires, especially. And when I hear that these fires are going to be, you know, um, obviously any fire is life changing to your residents, to the people around. Um, but eventually I, I, I didn't think of it as of the time because I'm just in shoot mode. I'm just documenting everything I can. I saw the moose come out over on 125 and I, you know, I was shooting that. I was trying to get the right angle. I was trying to tell the story with, you know, the moose in the foreground and the burned forest in the background and his escape route. Um, but I didn't really have an idea of what this was going to do. And, you know, I was mostly some of the pictures get sold afterwards, either for publications or books or they go on the newswire for uh, to tell the story of what happened. Um, but in a way, I've, I've been very blessed that Emily Hagen reached out to me because I, I didn't ever think of something like this. And I'm hoping that my pictures will make a difference. You know, somebody will see them and maybe they'll, they'll change somebody's mind and see the destruction of what something does. And they'll think twice about doing a campfire. Or they'll think twice about, you know, or what, what are the repercussions of me doing what I'm, you know, starting a fire in the forest when there's a fire ban? What's gonna, what, what is that gonna do if it gets out of control? I'm gonna be the one responsible. So I'm hoping that kind of, that, that picture kind of tells a story to somebody. And when she reached out to me, um, these pictures were put on Instagram um, and I was trying to get the word out through that to show what's going on in the Colorado mountains. Cause a lot of people in the front range, see smoke in the front about in the mountains and they think, oh, just another fire. But this is something that's impacting even today, um, our flooding yesterday that are, that are flooding into the, the troublesome fire. 125 was washed out again. And this is an ongoing thing. So I like to tell a story over a period of time. Um, the 9,000 images come from probably close to a hundred plus trips up to Grand Lake shooting the aftermath of the fire, immediately going back in with homeowners and, and so shooting pictures of them going through their homes, um, you know, trying to give them their space so they can grieve and, and take in what it is that they have to take in. Um, covering the winter that hit there, um, the people taking salvaging what they can out of what their house, what's left, the animals, the wildlife coming back, the regrowth, the 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 winter pack that will hopefully bring change the following year to uh, a lot of the the greenery, and then back up there many many times this spring, shooting the flowers coming up because I want to tell a story in its entirety. I don't like just I mean, I, I see the news do a lot of things where they get up there and they do the breaking news story of the fire and how devastating it is. And then, you know, two days later, you wouldn't even know that there was a fire up there because they're on to their next story. I kind of wanted to to document this as in its entirety and show, you know, how this is going to affect Grand Lake and the community. Um, like I said, I'm a Colorado native. I love Grand Lake. I love Grand County. Um, I've been coming up there for years. I, I hate to see what happened to it, but I'm a firm believer that these fires are, you know, far be it that if this was a lightning strike, I've heard that this is a human caused fire, but um, which is horrible. And there's nothing we can, you know, there's something we can do about the human caused part of it by, by informing people and teaching people. But, you know, if there's a lightning strike that happens Mother Nature is going to take its course, and we're going to try to do what we can to save what we can. So, um, but sorry, that was a long answer to your question, but 
No, that was great. I appreciate that. Um, I heard you're going to be coming back up again soon to take more photos of the area. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to space out what I'm shooting. Um, I was back up there a lot in the spring, um, early summer. I'm going to probably be back up there a couple more times over the month of August shooting. I want to kind of focus on more of our monsoon stuff that's happening and some of the runoff that's going to be causing some erosion problems in the area because I know back in the Sun Valley area a lot of that mountain was just completely there's not one ounce of foliage on the side of the hill and that's going to I've told a lot of the homeowners from my previous fire coverage I've covered flooding two weeks after fires have come through one being the Buffalo Creek fire I was back up there almost a month later and there was severe flash flooding where cars and boulders were being washed down the stream, similar to what we're dealing with today. And it, it's just a, a common thing with the fires comes the floods and within time things regrow and stabilize the hillside, which helps out, you know, a lot. A lot of people that I've talked to up there are not rebuilding right away because they want to see what happens to the 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 runoff before they start throwing back up a foundation that could eventually flood so they're very smart for doing that either that or putting up berms to and re you know reseeding i saw reseeding prob um, stuff happening almost immediately after the fire which was awesome to see homeowners back up on the hillsides with the things that spin mm -hmm. putting down whatever they can and now they've had some helicopters that have been going around and doing some yeah. of that too. Yeah, which is great to hear because that's, I mean, for a fire of this magnitude and how fast it burned, that's pretty much the only way you're going to reseed a forest like that. Um, I mean, even like the Buffalo Creek, um, the Hayman fire, which I was on, um, High Meadows fire, Snaking fire, Black Forest fire, all these big fires that we've had here in Colorado. Um, I, I've been gone back up and followed some of the fire crews around to help to sh shoot them reseeding and stuff. And some of them do it by hand. Some of them, if they have the budget, they do it by helicopter, depending on what's, you know, in the budget. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with the size of this one, I'm sure the helicopters are helping out quite a bit. Yeah, and even airplanes and stuff like that can help. I've seen them do that. Um, I'm excited that I've heard some stuff on you know, on the news lately about they're trying out some uh, night vision um, stuff for flying at night because, you know, during this fire, there was no aerial support because the winds were so erratic and so, so strong. Um, I was at ground zero when these things were coming through and, you know, we had, they've had reports of 160 mile an hour wind gusts through the, the valley, through Grand Lake Valley in that area. Um, and there's nothing you can do about stuff like that. I mean, you just have to let fire do what it's going to do and try to protect what you can um, for people that have cleared their area around their house, wetted down the ground around their house. They've done what they could. The firefighters have to stay there as long as they're safe and protect that structure. But at some point, you know, a life is a life you you can't stay and protect a structure if your life is going to be you know and, and i look at it the same way in photos you know i'm not going to put myself in a position where i'm gonna you know perish trying to take a photo i don't want that to happen but you know some of these photos that i shot over that couple day period um i saw just unbelievable weather from these these things, these fire tornadoes that would just hit, the fire would hit the coolness of the lake and the erratic winds would cause these incredible fire tornadoes that, I mean, I've seen them before, but not to like this magnitude. Yeah. Um, so how did you go about choosing the photos that are part of the exhibit and what was that process like? Um, well, when she, when Emily reached out to me, I was, uh, she was like kind of nervous that I wouldn't even respond. She was like really happy that I responded. And I was more than happy to work with her on this because um, I think through education, 
and getting the word out to the visitors and the people from out of state. Um, you know, we get people from all over that come up here. And I think this is a true upfront and upfront visual for people to see this. And I, it's a, it's a hard thing to describe because when I shoot the photos, I've been there, I've seen it. I know what this looked like. I've edited through the photos. Um, it's, I, I basically turned it over to Emily and I said, okay, I'm gonna narrow it down from 9,000 to 200 of the top, top images that I shot over that period. And it's a very hard edit because there's shots in there that I think are really good, but then there's some that are better. And so I kind of, I wanted to get a second and third set of eyes on it. So I had sent those over to her through a transfer service. And I said, you guys look through these and you choose what you want for the show that you think would best represent. And then send me back those images and I'll give you my opinions on them. And from what they picked, they did a really good job showing, um, I, at the time we were putting the show together, we, I was still shooting some of the regrowth. So we didn't have time to keep including a lot of the regrowth in it because we had to get it printed, hung and, and out to the community. So there is only one photo of the regrowth in there. Um, even though I have a ton more on my computer of animals coming back and foraging, you can see a lot on my Instagram of the regrowth and the green coming back and stuff. That to me is a really good sign that things are, you know, things are, are gonna come back. It's gonna take time, but, um, but yeah, the image, image selection process was all hers because, um, you know, I narrowed it down a little bit. So I wasn't sending her 9,000 images to look through, but um, she, she did a really good job, her and her coworker. So went through them and picked them all out, sent them back to me. Um, I kind of captioned them and titled them and then they went off to um, her for a final approval and then to the printing. And I was very excited that she wanted to include the artifacts. I think that was a big tie-in to the whole show that we include stories, photos, and artifacts. And I, I don't think I've ever seen this done. I mean, I've seen it done for other things, for other phenomenons, whether it be, you know, wildlife or ancient runes or something like that. But to see it done like this was very, very tasteful and very well put together for, because obviously we're, we're showing this to people that weren't there. Everyone else was going the other way and evacuating when we were up there. Firefighters were working, I was working to document stuff. Um, so they never saw any of this. So the first day we opened to the public, I saw even to the, the community, we had a soft opening to just the, the Grand Lake community. And I, I was blown away by the, the emotions that came from people because a lot of people stepped in here kind of knowing what it was, but I don't think they saw the same things because they, did, they, they didn't see what I saw on the news because the news came later, they got stopped, they weren't up in there, they weren't on the front line, they didn't see what, what I saw in the way of destruction, fire, wildlife fleeing, stuff like that. So this was kind of a, a front row to the fire, reliving that for a lot of the residents. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was, it, was, it was kind of, you know, a shock to see people, you know, literally break down, cry. Some people wouldn't go in, some people went in and left. Um, it was hard for them to, to swallow, you know, it was too new, it was too still fresh in their mind. Now, I can't speak for them because I've never lost my home to a fire. I've never, you know, I've covered a lot of fires. I've seen a lot of people lose their homes, but I physically have not felt the loss of losing everything that you've had and being taken out of your home and coming back to nothing. Um, I can't, I'm not gonna begin to try to tell you of what that would feel like for them because I don't know. But I'm hoping that with this show, your person coming in off the street, whether it be a Colorado native or somebody from another state or another country will look at these and, and see the ramifications of what 
a careless act from a hunter or a hiker or whoever started this fire and how that changed so many lives because it, it's it's a very sad thing that you know someone's carelessness has changed the lives of so many people and it it, it frustrates me and aggravates me there's nothing I can do about it, but educate people so it doesn't happen again. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. And just the way, like you said, with the artifacts and the photos and the stories, bring it all together, it really does give it that personal human element that I mean, anyone can, even if you didn't experience the fires and weren't here and didn't see it firsthand, um, I think it definitely will have an effect on visitors for a long time to come and I volunteered um, yesterday morning I was there okay, and they've been getting hundreds of visitors a yeah, day I'm, it's I'm, incredible I'm shocked Emily has told me um, you know how many people have been coming through and I didn't expect anything like that I knew you know Grand Lake is a very tourism town and you, you guys rely on your tourism dollars in the in the summer and winter but um, when she was telling me the the counter of people coming through. Um, I was actually up there when the Hymans came by, their whole family came by, and they've kind of adopted me into their family more than less because I was there, I was actually up there when they were removing the remains of, of um, Terry and Wayne, and um, right after that, and it was, it, it's very emotional to see something like that, to see what was happening and, you know, document each stage of it, them going back in and trying to collect the stuff that, of Wayne's that was left, seeing the, the flag being raised, seeing the, the property be demolished and the ground scraped clear and a new fresh start to what was there. I, they invited me back for the, the burial of them where they put their ashes in the ground. And, um, and then that same day, they all came over to see the show and that's very humbling to me that that they would they would want to see that and 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 know what happened and what happened to their parents and you know and see the the fury that they probably went through. Um, my my thought and hope is, is that this this show can travel a little bit. I know Emily has talked to a couple of people and they would love to see it go to Winter Park, possibly down along the I-70 route, maybe Idaho Springs, maybe down into Denver at some point, because I think, you know, this is, you know, there can be books written, there can be video pieces done, there can be published things on it. But I think this this show that people walk through and, and can literally put the artifacts with the pictures. I know there's some things in there where we actually have pictures of the stuff that was dug up and we have the artifact there that uh, what was, taken out of the ruins and um, of the fire. And I think that along with the stories, you know, kind of brings this whole thing full force, you know, into people's minds. And I'm hoping that people will go through this and they'll read the, the stuff and they'll adhere that there is a stage two fire ban right now. Um, you know, you can't, <laughs> You can't fix stupid on some people because they're going to go out and do what they can. But for the people that do see it, that really think twice about, you know, putting out your campfire. I mean, I've heard numerous stories about how this fire started from hunters that had left a fire burning and they wanted to come back to a warm fire and they left it burning when they were gone to uh, they didn't put it out right, it reunited and started this fire. Um, it's anybody's game, it's still under investigation. Those are all just, just stories that I've heard through the grapevine and they could be true or they couldn't be true. But either way, I hope Grand County gets some kind of, you know, relief out of this and they'll eventually find out who did this and put a close to this and then we can start the regrowth, the rebuilding. And I've seen a lot of people already rebuilding up there, which is really nice. Um, there is a lot of things that people have to deal with afterwards. And I've talked to a lot of owners and had conversations about insurance problems and 
and not getting enough from or being underinsured or not you know getting paid back to be able to rebuild like they were you know i like to look at it this way that you know Fortunately, that area doesn't have to worry about a fire from now on, you know, because what's burned is burned, but there is still a lot of beetle kill up there. There's still a lot of stuff that can burn. There's, you can't say with a straight face that this is not gonna happen again because it could happen in August. It could happen in October again. Mm -hmm. um, let's hope it doesn't. Let's hope that people see that and, and know that it is, they went through hell. They're not. Uh, they shouldn't have to go through this again. I wish we could make it a requirement for anyone visiting the mountains to go see the Troublesome Stories exhibit. Yeah. I think it would, you know, change a lot of minds, and I think it will, regardless. Um, you know, from what I've seen and the visitors that they've been getting, and and the effect that it's had on people, I think it's it's going to make a difference. Yeah. So thank you so much for everything you did. Yeah, and yeah, like I said, I just hope it gets to travel. I hope. It keeps to educate people. I'm I'm very, very honored to be part of this. I'm glad Emily reached out. This has been a great project to work with her on. Um, we've literally been arm in arm. We even went up to a property to, to pull some things out of a, a house that was burned with permission from one of the homeowners before they took it all off to scrap metal. And it was, it's just, a surreal thing to walk around property and look at things that and find things that were burned and you can kind of figure out what they are but we found a lock that the i think the lock was completely melted but the keys were still in the lock and you, you ask yourself how is that possible why would it burn up until the keys and then stop it's kind of like tornadic damage you know why why did the one silo go down and the other three weren't touched? Why did, why did one house burn and there was two houses right next to it that were fine? It's no one will ever know. It's just the way that the trees fell that day and the way the wind blew. And you know, I feel for a lot of these people and, and I, I hope personally I never have to go through what they've gone through. But um, you know, it's, it's nice to see that people are open to this show and and hopefully like i said it'll change the minds of somebody out there absolutely will we ever get to see any of the photos that you talked about from the hyman family um yeah actually i have them on my computer um i'm hoping um to somehow or another well, emily had talked to me about somebody doing a book about this or the initial start of a book and I would love to have some of those photos um, put in this. Um, eventually, maybe we'll add to the show as it travels or even add to it later this summer, depending on what space we can make for the photos. But I would like to add some because a lot of this stuff was actually happening. Um, like I said, the, the, the day the show opened to the community and to the public, that week, that was the week that they were actually laying Lyle and Marilyn to rest. And, um, you know, it was very humbling being there that day. And, and, you know, they, their mom and dad died where they wanted to be. And I've heard a lot of stories about, you know, it was during COVID and to leave your house as an elderly couple that had been together for their, pretty much their whole lives since high school sweethearts and to possibly be put up in some place they don't know. I, I've been told several times that they died where they wanted in the house that they, they built and the forest that they knew. And it wasn't something like they were stuck in a shelter with people with COVID, you know, and losing a home at that age. I just, I couldn't imagine being like that. I mean, when I had heard he was, he had been a firefighter, a volunteer firefighter, a retired firefighter. Yeah, he was a Denver firefighter. A matter of fact, the day that I was up there with Glenn, we were down in the basement um, in the rubble and nothing but ash. And he was frantically looking for a ladder that it was a ladder from back in the 1900s that firefighters used. It was the hook and ladder that they used to climb up to rescue people out of windows. And he actually found it. We got pictures of him finding it and the ladder. But that was one of the things that his dad cherished 
is this ladder and it obviously was somewhere in the house and when the house burned and collapsed it was buried under tons of you know ash and soot and uh, we got very dirty that day but we found a lot of stuff that that meant a lot to Wayne and his family and we were able to unearth it and, and you know have it I don't think that was part of the show because I think he took that as a sentimental thing but um but uh just visualize just see being at um you know right behind the camera to see all this stuff is you know I look back at it now at the time I was trying to I was kind of in creative mode to try to get the right angle and the right lighting and the right scene and all of this but you look back and you understand what the feeling was that these people grew up in this house they knew this house this is where their parents lived and now they're going through you know three feet of ash of nothing left it's just unfathomable it's fire is such a destructive thing so well thank you again for everything that you did i hope we get to see some more of those photos yeah. someday and i know the exhibit's gonna continue to do well you know wherever it ends up going yeah yeah and i'm i'm gonna be back up there in october too i know that emily had talked about having um a ceremony on the, at the top date and time of the fire in October. And I'm hoping to be back up there to cover that and kind of put a full wrap on this from, um, from October of last year to October of this year. And she's trying to organize something to where we all walk out of town or walk down the street or something at the exact time that they were all being evacuated. I don't know where she's at on that, but um, I know she had briefly talked to me about that. That sounds so that, amazing. And hopefully that could be a very person. Yeah, a very moving piece. But I thank all the firefighters for all the stuff that they did. I mean, it's got to be frustrating, you know, being up there and not being able to save a house, but being able to save a house. And, you know, I've had people afterwards when they saw my photos, they were like, were you up on this highway? Did you see if my house was there? And at the time, this was the smoke was so thick, I didn't know what highway was what to another because it looked so different. You couldn't see anything. So, you know, I didn't know whether their house survived, but I did have one person. They saw a photo that I had taken and they saw their house in the background and they knew that the initial fire had come through and they saw that the one structure was burnt, but their house was still standing. And they sent me a very nice message saying, that was the best photo we ever saw because we knew we knew that we had lost our garage down below, but our house was still standing up above. Yeah, and because it was weeks before they got back in, and this I shot that night of the fire, mm -hmm. so they knew that when they came back, they would at least have a house to come back to. Wow, what a wonderful thing to be able to provide for someone. Yeah, that that made me very happy, and and uh, you know some people didn't get that that reassurance but um but anyway i hope i hope people see the wildlife and how it affects a lot of things because i know here in colorado we all love our wildlife and you know i've heard a lot of stories but i saw a lot of dead animals that you know that that was the last breath they took and then they just laid down and that was it mm -hmm. so not only the two human lives it took but it took a lot from the mother nature side yeah more than we'll ever know yeah.